Hello everyone, uh, I am Vicky Murillo, the director of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University, and I want to welcome you all on behalf of myself as my co-organizers Ben Orlov and Gustavo Asania to this conference uh, on rethinking society, nature and society in Latin America, which is co-sponsored by the ILAS, the Columbia Global Centers in Rio and Santiago, the CSD. CSSD and the IRCPL and the IRI at the Earth Institute. I also want to thank Monica Trigo and Esteban Andrade for the support in making this conference technically possible. Today we're having the fourth panel in this conference. You can find the videos of the prior panels in our webpage. The information should be on the chat. Um, and you can also get information about the following panels if you follow us in Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We are ILAS at Columbia University. And in particular, it's important to notice that although we'll be having panels every Friday, next Friday, the 30th, we will not have any panel because it's the commencement at Columbia. So we will come back on May 7th with the panel on politics and policy. If you are watching us through YouTube, uh, you can make your questions in the comment section and they will be uh, bring to us by uh, Monica in the chat and we can ask the questions from the audience. So please use the comment section in YouTube. Today, uh, we have the fourth panel in this conference, which is in governance and intervention. And the chair will be Jeffrey Schrader, which is with a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Jeff, it's now up to you. Great, thanks, Vicky. Uh, yes, we have a fantastic panel uh, of four speakers today, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the various talks, so let's get right into it. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Haoni Hajao, an associate professor in environmental management and social studies of science and technology at UFMG. Uh, wide-ranging, fantastic work on forestry, forest preservation, uh, and spatial modeling. Uh, and Hany, if you want to go ahead and share your slides, we can go right into the into the first talk. Yep, we're shooting for 10-minute talks. I'll give you a warning at three minutes and one minute uh, in the chat as we're moving along. But go ahead and take it away. Thank you. I wonder if you'd like to unmute yourself. Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, I was thanking you and Vicky, and you know, it's a, I'm very glad to be here. Um, uh, well, since it's a compact uh, presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the issues around how to make research uh, uh, high impact research, and I'll bring in also some inspiration from science and technology studies, uh, with some area I'm coming from, uh, in addition to spatial modeling and also uh, spatial analysis. analysis. Um, so basically, one of the key problems here um, of you know it's broad generalization, but quite, quite often you have in social studies of science um, a, a, a kind of research which is ex excellent in terms of trying to understand how the science policy interface takes place. Uh, it has an empirical understanding of policy making, and also it's very good at criticizing, but actually not as good in terms of giving prescriptions and directions. Um, the general sciences, on the other hand. Uh, it's based on, on social and natural phenomena outside policy making, and it tends to have a quite an idealized understanding of how policy making should have, because it's you know, it's based on, on evidence, and of course, if the evidence shows one direction, then policy makers will certainly go in that direction. But in practice, things are much more complicated, and it it, it has actually uh, it's very difficult for uh, you know for the hard science in general to grasp uh, this issue of how. Uh, and why their uh, uh, indications and recommendations are not taken up by, by policy. Um, and so basically here, I'm, I'm providing some of the rationale behind some of the work we have been doing uh, here at the Federal University of Minas Gerais uh, in trying to maximize the impact, the policy impact of the work we have been doing. And uh, it basically follows three main steps, uh, inspired also by other authors, you know, especially actor network theory, Latour and others have been talking about this. So basically we have, you know, also draw some experience on that. Uh, so first, you know, have to choose a policy question demanding an answer. Uh, so look out there and see what's going on and what are uh, the most pressing issues uh, in society, not so much in academia. Uh, you need to provide an answer using a strong language uh, so you also need to understand what kind of language is better received on the other side of the of the policymaking environment, 
and then position yourself as part of the solution, not only as a, as a problem identifier, but also as part of the solution. And, um, and here, the problem we tackle, which actually, you know, we have been doing this for, for a long time, but specifically the problem that we were interested in uh, was to answer this question. Is my food linked to deforestation? Especially, is my food linked to illegal deforestation? Uh, which has been a growing issue, not only in Brazil, but abroad in Europe with the different uh, due diligence uh, regulations taking place in the United States right now. Also, they want to, to uh, actually further uh, uh, research in this direction. And, um, and it is particularly problematic since illegal deforestation is also an environmental crime. And, uh, and it's a very actual difficult question to answer straightforwardly, because if you look at the website of the different uh, uh, large food producers and food exporters, they're going to present you this. You know, you are, we are very sustainable. Uh, we have zero heads of cattle linked to the first station. So don't worry about the food you consume from us. But then at the same time, you have NGOs especially uh, showing that uh, that's not, you know, that, that does not seem to be the case. And you have different uh, instances where um, very high levels of the first stations are linked to food production and food export. Um, so how do you, how do you deal with this, right? How do you go beyond uh, the private monitoring solutions which are there right now and have been proven uh, to be unreliable? Uh, and 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 basically how you can improve the situation whereby the Brazilian government itself has been failing to monitor supply chains that identify illegal deforestation, especially then what's the role of of the sciences engineering in uh, in in this situation? So this is basically how we brought uh, and made, you know, uh, uh, put science in action. Uh, so this is our research group. It's, uh, it's, we are actually right now reaching about uh, 40 people. Uh, for this research specifically, it was about uh, 20 people that were involved. So it's actually, it's a large effort involving not only myself, but also uh, all the professors and, 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 and a multidisciplinary staff. And it actually involves uh, uh, many steps, you know, from remote sensing in order to understand whether there has been deforestation or not, uh, to cartography and biology because you have trying to apply uh, the different different conservation rules which require, for instance, identifying the biome, the phytophysiologies, and also uh, uh, legal scholars that have helped us to understand how, what what is the Brazilian legislation and why and how it identifies what's legal from what is illegal. Um, spatial modeling. So basically apply all, all, all that knowledge in terms of an automatic uh, analysis uh, uh, system. And also computer science and big data, because we are talking here uh, in the whole of Brazil, it's, you, you have right now about 7 million individual farms. Uh, for this study, uh, we have analyzed around uh, more than 800 uh, uh, thousand farms and individually, one by one, trying to understand uh, what's going on in those areas. And this is actually start to to, uh, to, uh, um, to create some barriers, actually, actually computational barriers. Uh, that's why, for instance, uh, we have uh, uh, an important part of our team are actually programmers developing the tools that we use to do uh, this kind of, of big data, big, big spatial data analysis. And then you need uh, social scientists, you know, policy experts uh, to uh, understand the results, uh, understand how those results are to actually talk to uh, uh, debates that are taking place right now. And this has been building on uh, actually a long trajectory uh, that this lab here at the Federal University of Minas Gerais has been building up in the last 20 years, uh, of which I'm, 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 I'm a part of in the last uh, 10 years, uh, related to special modeling, special projections, and also uh, different uh, very heavyweight publications, such as this one uh, in science, but also proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, uh, Nature, and so on. And this is the, the bigger schema of the model we have developed in order to answer uh, that question. So uh, initially, uh, the first step is actually to, to model and trying to understand farm by farm, uh, what's the status of that farm in relation to the environmental legislation. Uh, so basically considering the size of the farm, uh, which based on which then you have to apply different rules. And then also with the combination of uh, cartographic information related to rivers, biomes, and also annual deforestation from MIMPE, uh, uh, we brought this together, uh, create a model that actually implemented different parts of the legislation. And then in the end, we have here the situation of the farm in 2008 in relation to uh, the restoration process in which they can actually take 20 years to resolve their problems. 
and then also after 2008 to see whether there has been deforestation that farm, but also whether that deforestation has been respecting or not the minimum percentages required uh, by Brazil's forest code. So at least we can say whether that deforestation is likely to have been done legally or it's, it's actually very likely to be illegal deforestation. After that is done, uh, it's very important to understand what that specific, what that specific farm is doing. You now, is it producing soy? How much soy is it producing beef? Uh, how much beef? And in order to model also to, and, and, to, and to represent the supply chains and to see the linkages between the legality and illegality taking place here in the individual farms in relation to the forest code and food production. And then finally, you have to model that with exports uh, in order to understand what are the implications of that. So this is basically a, a representation of the main data sources used, for instance, to model uh, the situation of the state of, of uh, Pará uh, with the different steps uh, required to get to the other end where you can see, um, for instance, whether deforestation has been taking place prior to 2002, which means that you can you could deforest up to 50% of your farm. If it's after 2002, then you apply different rules. It must be 80% of forest conservation and so on and so forth. And this, for instance, the example of one specific farm uh, where we have identified uh, the different layers and the different moments in which the precision has taken place. And based on that, then we can understand whether this farm has a forest debt. Uh, so it means it must restore and also whether that farm has illegal deforestation after 2008. And these are some of the results. Um, so for instance, we have seen for, for, for the whole Amazon and the Cerrado, uh, that actually uh, about 45% of the farms in both biomes uh, are not compliant with the forest code uh, in relation to what is required to be done and what's required to be conserved in 2008. So they need to do some actions uh, in order to, to be compliant. Uh, but most concerning, uh, you have also about 15% of the farms in the Amazon and 20 in the Cerrado that have been, that have been deforesting uh, after 2008. Uh, of which actually the vast majority, especially the Amazon, has been doing so without respecting uh, the legislation. And this, this data in particular was, was very important in the, the, the policy debate because quite often the government and others have been saying that, uh, that, you know, we, we, that often the deforestation data mixes up legal and illegal and it's allowed by Brazilian legislation to the forest. And we show here that if you ended up with all illegal deforestation as has been promised by President Bolsonaro uh, yesterday at the Biden's uh, um, uh, climate event, then you would have a drastic reduction uh, on deforestation. And also we link that to where it's produced, for instance, soy, uh, into, at which levels and how much of the soy produced in different municipalities is actually linked to uh, illegal deforestation. And what are the traders that are buying and selling it and to which countries in Europe uh, the soy is arriving to. And also the same kind of analysis was also done in relation to uh, this, the cattle supply chain, which is actually much more complex than soy because you have, for instance, farms that can, so, that can sell a cow to another farm and then another farm prior to arriving at the, uh, at the final destination with this lot packer that then exports the meat. And quite often uh, the, the forester is not the person providing directly the, 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 the meat to the meat packer, but actually some other intermediary step. And our modeling was has been able to map also up to 10 levels of depth uh, uh, deforestation taking place in the supply chain. Uh, and that's because uh, what I have found that even though you have uh, a, a sizable portion of, of uh, about 10% uh, of um, the illegal deforestation taking place at direct, supply, uh, direct suppliers of beef uh, in the Amazon, actually 50% uh, of the total cattle that arrives at the, at, at the meat packers are linked to deforestation at, at previous steps. So actually, if you look, if you monitor the last step of, of the supply chain, you are looking at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the entire, you know, most of the ice is underneath the ocean here. And so basically, one thing is to put all, all, that, all that, that research together that, you know, it was uh, um, more than two years of work, but then it's very important to, uh, uh, to present it, to make it go through uh, uh, a very strong uh, uh, peer review process in order to have a strong voice in the debate. Because we knew that uh, as, uh, if, if, if we deliver this message, that the main message here is that's about 20% of Brazil's exports 
uh, are linked to uh, illegal deforestation, we would be hit from all directions. So that's why we have chosen actually Science, Science Magazine to be uh, the, the journal where that was about to receive our, our contribution. And, um, and having already published there, we know that's a very demanding uh, um, um, a process of, of review because it has extremely high levels of transparency and reproducibility. For instance, we had to detail our research uh, I mean, more than 70 pages of supplemental material, also with, with an interactive website where people can go there and download, and download most of the data uh, linked to, to the research. But then finally we got on, on that other side, um, which it's, it was also a way for us to, uh, um, because you know, quite often today we tend to emphasize the weaknesses of science as an institution in comparison to uh, uh, fake news and, and, uh, and uh, and, and uh, you know, the dissolution of uh, science as an institution. But we also have to remember that it's still very powerful and it's still a very, a very recognizable voice, uh, especially because uh, it has a, a, a circle uh, uh, of, of, of reputation and, and the creation of, uh, of, of strengthening a message that comes from recognition, that then you're able to get grants, then you're able to uh, build up certain levels of equipment and, and knowledge uh, that produce arguments, that produce articles, and this feeds into self, uh, these different levels of and the different types of capital uh, builds on itself and creates a, 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 a type of uh, a statement which is very hard uh, to uh, counter based on the same level of, of, uh, of debate. And also, um, it has some very strong connections uh, with the different ways in which uh, information is diffused in society. Uh, sp specifically in the case of science, um, basically all newspapers in the world uh, uh, get uh, every week uh, an anticipation of what are the main articles coming out in science. And since this article was identified by science editors as, as a high impact uh, uh, article, then you, you, we basically had uh, also this, this very big demand from uh, journalists from all over the world in order to get to understand more what we have just published. And, the, and that indeed had a, a, a very a big impact uh, in terms of, of media outlets and, and policy making. Uh, this study featured more than 80 uh, news articles, radio, TV. I myself gave you know, interviews in, in Portuguese, Spanish, Italian. Uh, it was actually quite intense uh, uh, two, three weeks after the publication of, of the article, including Brazil's main uh, uh, TV stations. And, uh, and, and it was interesting because uh, I have been already in touch with some key people inside the, the government, uh, telling them about this study because I think it's, it's, it's from, uh, it's a, a way to play fair, you know, to let people know about what's coming out. And, uh, and I don't think they really understood uh, uh, what it means to have a, a published paper, uh, a, a paper published in science or the, or the weight uh, science can still have in, in modern society. So I think most of them have probably thought, okay, just an university, they are a guy doing some research that nobody is going to read. And then suddenly, all the news journalists were with the microphones pointing there at, at, at the face of, you know, vice president and others asking, oh, have you read the science article that just came out, you know, and, uh, and so I don't think they really expected that. And indeed, uh, from uh, President uh, Mourão, uh, uh, from President Bolsonaro, that actually uh, made some indirect critiques to the study, up to Vice President Mourão, and even the Minister of Agriculture, all the main uh, political figures in Brazil has reacted. Uh, to 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 the article, and we uh, I, actually I want to believe that probably the main of them was you know quite a few of them was reading a scientific article for the first time in their lives uh, they're out, out of the press, but it, it's at least it shows uh, how sometimes you know it's possible to to have something uh, that's actually read that's actually taken into consideration, um, and also as as expected you know because uh, we were pointing out at, at an issue at the heart of Brazil's agribusiness. And, uh, and that was something that, uh, you know, international buyers have been worried for a long time and did not have hard evidence on the level of contamination of their physicians uh, from Brazil. So as expected, uh, um, uh, part of the agribusiness mobilized against us, mobilized to, to, to trying to demo demolish the arguments. Some of them managed even to put some uh, uh, articles, opinion articles in some newspapers, and even tried to, uh, a, a researcher specifically, uh, um, went on, on science and actually uh, tried to, to do a counter argument, which was found not um, uh, sufficiently rigorous uh, by the journal to be put forward. So in the end, um, having all that work uh, put together in order to have a strong voice, in order to position yourself, in order to pass through uh, uh, the, you know, the, the hurdles which involved peer, peer 
uh, review really paid off in terms of uh, uh, having a more strengthened position in the public debate. This is fantastic. If you could uh, just wrap up and we'll move on to the next uh, uh, part of the panel, thanks. Yeah. Uh, and so just, you know, finally, uh, here's the problem. Here's the problem stated out in a very strong way, but then you need to try to be part of the solution of all of the problem. That's why following up the article, we have been having, you know, different meetings with uh, NGOs, meat packers, buyers, international buyers, investors, trying to understand better what was, what was in there. But also uh, we did agreements with the public attorney's office and also the state of Pará. Uh, and also uh, proposed a, a legislation with Congressman Zé Silva to actually realize that vision, you know, to create a monitoring system based on the methods that we have developed in this article so that uh, um, international buyers, cattle ranchers, different banks could check on real time whether the meat they are buying, the soy they are buying is coming from uh, a legal source or not. So some conclusions, um, doing policy oriented geosciences is complex, it's multidisciplinary, it's dynamic, it's demanding. Uh, it requires big science, you know, in a large and very integrated team and uh, with stable funding sources. Uh, so it's not, you know, something a, a PhD student could do on its own, uh, which also means some in entry barriers there. Um, but actually the social, legal and managerial obstacles are as challenging as the technical scientific ones because if we put all this edifice together and position ourselves answering an, uh, answering an issue that was not as pressing as the one we put together, we would certainly not have as much of, of an impact. Uh, and so that's why, you know, taking the lessons from science and technology studies from the social sciences and applying them uh, to, to, to the hard sciences in order to better positions ourselves in terms of the public debates and, and, and improvement of, of, of society at large. I think there are some big benefits in there. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, fantastic. Yeah, a very important lesson. Uh, so I, I come from a fisheries background myself. I'm gonna reserve my comments mostly uh, until the end, but it is just fascinating to me always to see, uh, especially forestry work in the overlap that it has and so the areas of difference with, uh, with fisheries work, but absolutely the importance the issue of making the question important to policymakers is, is first order. Um, great. Uh, Maria Alejandra Velez will be our next speaker. Maria, if you want to go ahead and share your slides. Uh, Maria is the director of the Center for Studies on Security and Drugs, the associate professor at the Faculty of Economics at uh, Universidad de los Andes, and the founding member, member of the Center for the Sustainable Development Goals for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and today, will be talking to us about uh, another forestry topic about collective uh, titling. So Maria, take it away. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you for the organizing uh, committee to invite me to present. Um, I'm going about I'm going to talk about collective titling in Colombia and in particular in the Pacific region. Rather than presenting one paper, I will try in these 10 minutes to to show you what I have learned in, in basically more than 15 years of of, of research agenda with Afro-Colombian communities in this area. Um, but let me start with some context here. Uh, as some of you may know, 30% or 33% of, of the land in Latin America is owned by ethnic communities under collective titling. This is the case in Colombia, 30% of ethnic communities have uh, uh, collective titles. Uh, but here I'm going to show you the process of the collective titling of Afro-Colombian communities, which are ethnic communities, but not indigenous communities, which is different from the rest of Latin America. Just to give you some context, Afro-Colombian communities have been settled in the Pacific region since the 17th century. And basically, until 1991, Colombian government viewed the Pacific region as a massive forest reserve of unoccupied land, basically ignored the presence of this community for 300 years. You can see in the map where they're located. Finally, in 1991, Colombia government recognized that we were a diverse country and recognized the right of collective titling of Afro-Colombian communities. And this was sort of developed in a law, law, law 70, which is basically for some of the Afro-Colombian communities, the most important thing that had happened in the country after the abolition of slavery. 
So the idea of this law was basically to benefit group that historically occupied these territories to preserve, of course, valuable ecosystems. And the way to do so was to organize the communities as community councils, which is the political and territorial organizations. There are some huge community councils of 800 hectares, 800,000 hectares. There are some small community councils, but diversity basically is the unit of analysis. The first title was issued in 1996. And today we have almost 6 million of hectares, uh, uh, which is 5% of the country under 170 community councils. This is the, a massive uh, agrarian reform uh, and the most important recent in Latin America. However, it's a contested issue. For example, in 2019, The Economist wrote why Colombian Pacific Coast is so poor. And it says collective land ownership holds the region back. It was basically an ideological position, uh, 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 basically stating that the only the only way to manage the forest was by, by, by via a private property without any data to support this issue. Uh, and I say without any data because we have been using the data to understand the process. Of course, I wrote a letter to the editors and basically what the letter said is what I'm going to show you in this presentation. So the first paper that we did uh, in this uh, area was to understand the effect of basically in well-being of these communities. And I'm not going to go through the details because it's already a published paper, but basically what we tried to estimate was the impact of collective titling on well-being of Afro-Colombian communities in the department of Chocó. Um, basically what we found is that collective land titling create a more secure property right base and a longer time horizon that allows households to actually invest in physical and human capital. And we found um, results that are equivalent to those uh, reforms that are doing uh, private titles. We found that it reduced people under $1 uh, per capita income. It increased income per capita. It increased the system of uh, ch uh, children to go to school. It improved uh, uh, households' conditions, for example, investment in changing the walls and the floors of the, of the houses. And it reduced number of people in the, in the household. So it, you know, with several indicators, what we showed that by comparing collective titles without uh, uh, collective property and households without with collective property, those with collective property were better off uh, with all the impact evaluation techniques. After that, we thought, okay, maybe this is the case, but it was a trade-off between well-being and conservation. And that was the second paper that we did with a couple of colleagues in Colombia and Costa Rica. And what we found basically once more comparing collective titles versus communities with comparable characteristics, but without collective title and controlling for all the typical uh, variables that are controlling these deforestation studies, distance to national parks, distance to small rivers, distance to uh, main roads, uh, distance to uh, coca crops, uh, etc. What we found again is that titling the Pacific region has decreased deforestation by more than one percentage point, which is uh, uh, would represent an effect of more than 27 percent reduction of what would have been deforestation rates without titling. We found here, of course, that there were heterogeneous effects, that some regions were like sort of driving this, this effect. And this, in this project, we also conduct qualitative, uh, uh, we have qualitative data and interviews with local leaders. And what we found is that basically the mechanism of why this is happening is, is via two things. First, um, basically community organization and governance, there was a boom of management plans and internal codes to start formalizing the rules to manage the territory. But also, and more important perhaps, they were, they were able to uh, um, kick out of their territories legal extractive companies that in the absence of the collective title were, were having um, concessions to exploit uh, the forest. Of course, so so far, we have found that with collective titles, all, com all, all of these communities are better off in terms of quality of life and uh, well welfare indicators, and also forest is, has been protected. 
But of course, it's a region with still a lot of challenges, expansion of illicit crops, management of fisheries, illegal mining, and community enterprises. Let me focus here on the region, on the expansion of illicit crops. Collective titles by itself has not been able to stop the pressure of illegal activities, which in many cases actually is accompanied by armed groups. So the, the formalization of the title in the absence of the, mo the monopoly of the force of the states, are, they are very vulnerable. But we have documented a lot of community resistance. Of course, it's a resistance that the communities are assuming a lot of risk in the absence of the state. But uh, we are now studying that. And basically is that the capacity of local communities to organize and cooperate for the management of natural resources and the public, public provision of, of local public good has been widely documented in behavior of the commons literature commons literature that the economists didn't read. <laughs> and the literature of civil war and conflict has also studied the capacity of civilians to organize and mobilize. But little is known about the emergence of resistance and collective action in the context of illicit economies. So we are studying this community resistance and the collective action against the expansion of illicit economies, something that is beyond the titling process. As you may know, Colombia is the most important supplier of cocaine uh, for Europe and the US. And in 2017, we reached a peak in coca crops. 38% of these coca crops is located in the Pacific region. And in fact, 16% of all the coca crops that are, in, that are in the country are located in this community council that receive collective titling. So the titling, despite the fact that the, it has been um, very efficient in reducing deforestation. Uh, it is struggle um, uh, with the expansion of illicit crops. Still, some communities do not have the presence of illicit crops, and we were wondering why. Um, so our interest is in a region, uh, in a municipality called Buenaventura, which is in the center, sort of the Pacific region. And as you can see in a zoom here, in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this map, all the red dots are basically presence of coca crops in 2018. And here in Buenaventura, as you can see, we, have, we are basically uh, surrounded by illicit crops. So what we did uh, is like asking this why. You know, Buenaventura has basically all the conditions for the expansion of illicit crops, low institutional presence, precarious socioeconomic conditions, neighbors with coca. And we wanted to understand why some communities have coca and why others doesn't. So we did a mix of methods, including interviews, household surveys, a, a, a satellite imagery to understand the expansion of illicit crops. And what we found basically is that in the face of the potential expansion of illicit crops, communities are not passive actors. Some decide to oppose illicit crops by engaging in different forms of resistance. And we created a typology of resistance between leaders and community members that I'm not going to explain because I don't have time. And what we found basically comparing communities with coca crops and communities without coca crops, what we basically found, among other things, um, with the survey that we conducted at the household level, is that those communities that doesn't have coca has a greater stock of social capital and the capacity to organize. And this um, resistance, that this has translated in resistance to the expansion of illicit crops, meaning that themse they themselves eradicate manually the coca crops or have rules so that people don't uh, cultivate coca crops, etc. So what we think is that successful community resistance results when leaders are able to articulate and sustain a discourse that pre permeates many community spaces. Uh, of course, that community resistance is risky and is both uh, has external pressures and internal factors. Uh, but in the absence of a stable public good provisions and viable economic uh, opportunities, this resistance, of course, is fragile. However, uh, I think it's an opportunity to reorient this type of policies in the underground and invest in the organizational capacity of communities and the strength of local leadership, who apparently is the only thing that is preventing the expansion of these illicit economies. I think this should translate in more effective and tailored policies with expected spillover for economic and unproductive activities. Um, 
So I think I'm going to stop with that. Uh, the message is that these communities have been better off with the collective titling. It has reduced deforestation. It has in in increased welfare. But there is still a lot of challenges, including the expansion of illicit economies. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, again, absolutely fascinating. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, I, I just keep thinking of, of comparisons to uh, my fisheries background and. Uh, there's a lot of collective action there as well, and you see a lot of uh, uh, good enforcement examples in those cases, and some poor, poor enforcement example uh, uh, cases. And I'll be curious to hear more about that uh, when we move to the discussion afterwards. So thank you. Uh, all right, our third presenter in the four-part panel is Leticia Marino. Uh, Leticia, if you want to go ahead and put your slides up, I can introduce you. Uh, Leticia is the professor at the National University of Mexico, uh, has done uh, you know, tremendous breadth of work, including being the lead author on the uh, global report from the IPBES on ecosystem uh, health and biodiversity. And today is going to talk about um, mining in uh, Mexico. I think if you want to go to your first slide. You okay. Can... Um, am I sharing? Yes, I can see it. Uh, okay. And you can go okay. into full screen if you'd like. Okay, let me... Uh, let me do it. Okay. Perfect. So is mining sustainable in Mexico? I'm not going to talk so much about collective action here, but about elite capture. And uh, I'm, I mean, I have I've, I'm new on the on the field of of mining studies, but uh, it's it's becoming such a pervasive. I mean, the expansion of mining industries, extractive industries, it's becoming such an expansive. Um, activities uh, in Mexico. And uh, there's a strong resistance to change, uh, to change laws, to change policy in order to, to halt the, the impact, the tremendous impact it has had in the last 20 years in health and in health of ecosystem health and public health. So uh, I'm, I'm going to, to start. Um, I think I will pass this this uh, well this slide. I would only say that uh, the boom of of, um, of mining in Latin America and Mexico, and we have Eduardo Gudiñas, who's a real expert on, on this topic, uh, start in the 80s as part of the of the reorientation of the economies imposed in the context of the debt negotiation, and the. Uh, Mining extraction in Latin America, which is a continent, the, the global continent with the, uh, the highest presence in terms of, of uh, minerals per hectare uh, of mine, um, it's, been, it's been impressive. I mean, it has increased between 70s and 2017, it increased by 60, 22%. Latin America, not, I don't know if it's the or one of the, but I think it's very likely that it's the global region with the richest nature in terms of biodiversity, water and natural forest. And it's also uh, uh, the richest region in terms of, of mineral. And uh, according to CEPAL, uh, it's also the world region suffering the highest level of biodiversity loss and, and water pollution of environmental destruction. So Mexico in this context is even a more increased case. Mexico is the fifth most diverse country in the world and it's the first world producer of silver and has large deposits of lithium, uh, gold and copper. It's also a home of indigenous group. It's not only uh, a rich nature, but it's a, a huge uh, cultural biodiversity in Mexico, indigenous uh, groups whose rights are recognized by the Mexican constitution and international jurisprudence signed by Mexico and violated systematically by mining concessions. Mining boom started in the 90s, just in the eve of the implementation of NAFTA. I mean, very related to it as most of the uh, investment in, in mining, it's uh, Canadian, but also Mexican. And uh, what I want to address specifically, it's that there is a development narrative of government and corporations, which is very powerful, that present mining as an undeniable path of development and even for sustainable development. This discourse, which has increased in Mexico during the last uh, years, 
tries to justify the legal priority of, of mining, uh, the mining law, it's, it's a clear case of elite capture, and the government preferential treatment that mining has received during the COVID crisis. Uh, and the strong resistance I was, I was talking about of legal uh, and political changes. So um, there is a colonial vision still in mining policy and mining laws, regulations in Mexico and Latin America, all Latin American legislations. I mean, and I'm part of a group we did a comparative legal analysis of Latin American mining legislation and all the laws consider minerals as a public property which creates a number of problems and mining as an activity of public interest. But Mexican mining law goes further and gives mining priority over all other economic and activities and land uses. As I said, prevalence of mining favors a strong process of elite capture and Mexican law, it's a clear case. Uh, so as I was telling Mexico, uh, concessions in Mexico has increased, sorry, very rapidly. Um, now it's almost 15% of the national territory, which is concess concessioned and 33% of the forest regions with temperate forest. I use, used to study community forestry, but now community forestry is under uh, this threat very seriously. So uh, why I said that mining law is the most pervasive, uh, the most permissive mining uh, law in Latin America. The concession periods in Mexico can go for uh, for a hundred years. There's no limit in geographical extension. Uh, concessions can be buy and sold in the global stock uh, market, so miners can start making money before they start even exploration activities. As I said, they have preferential access to land and water, uh, even violating already established uh, property rights and collective property rights. It is to say that 60% of Mexico's land is under collective rights and about 60% of the forest land is under collective lands, but as the, as the government owns legally the subsoil, uh, these lands can be concessioned. Uh, Mexico was defined in 2014 as the most attractive global destination for mining investment because of the low flexibility, because of the low salaries, Mexican minimum wage, it's the lowest together with Honduras in Latin America, and because of the country's uh, rich mineral uh, deposits. Um, and still, environmental and social impacts of mining are still uh, not held uh, all over the country because most of the concessions are in explore, exploration phase. Uh, as I said, um, there's Mexican and, and Canadian, also Chinese and American capital, that may, mostly Mexican and Canadian. But the fact that Mexicans own 60% of the capital in mining uh, activities uh, doesn't, uh, does, has, has not produced any goods for, for the country of mining regions uh, in the country, but it, it's based in huge, uh, in huge uh, impunity. There are two very iconic cases. One, it's the, uh, it's um, the, sorry, it's the, the collapse of Pasta de Conchos mine in Coahuila where 65 miners were buried and the toxic spill of millions of gallons of copper sulfate in the Sonora River in 2014 the most serious environmental accident in the history of the country that took place in mines owned both by Grupo Mexico, which is the largest mining group in Mexico. Uh, Canadians are mostly owners of the concessions for gold and silver. So a question, which I think it's very worth uh, posing, if mining is defined as an activity of public interest, does it contribute really to public good so uh, we go and search some economic uh, general numbers and we found that mining contributes only with 0.9 of the country's GDP and that the fiscal contributions of mining rights are really poor. Uh, the mining right, the, the rights that uh, miners pay are only 0 0.29 dollars or 20 cents of dollars and con the country uh, 
gives back mining corporations 50% of the taxes. Share of mining taxes in the total federal tax collation, collection is 0.41%. <coughs> taxes count only for 3% of the earnings of mining production reported by the corporations, while the, the taxes that the rest of the taxpayers paid in the country are around 30%. Uh, including forest community uh, industries. Taxes paid by mining corporations in Mexico are 50% lower in average than those paid in Latin American countries. So uh, the, the contribution to, to work, to employment, it's only 0.66% of the formal employment in the countries, while 50% of the mining workers are contracted through outsourcing schemes. So they don't have any labor, uh, labor rights in spite of the, of the risks they, they face in, in uh, mining activities. So uh, the gold extracted from Mexico uh, between 2019 and 2015 was six times higher than the gold extracted during the 300s years of the colonial route and most of the gold extraction, it's based on open pit technology. Uh, for the production of one ounce of gold uh, with this technology in the largest uh, mines of Mexico in Sonora and Zacatecas, for just one ounce, uh, there are used 40 kilograms of explosive, 200,000 of liters of water are used. This is the consumption of a family during a year, 500 liters of fuel with emissions of 650 kilograms of CO2 and 150 tons of rock are discarded. I mean, this is amazing when 53% of the gold extracted globally is used in jewelry and in the production of coins and bank reserves. So very dismissive. Might be me, but I lost the sound from Leticia. Yes, yes, we don't hear her. Okay, can Just you hear down. me? Yes, okay. I can. So there, I mean, uh, last year there was uh, a report was published by the Mexican uh, Camera of Mining. I mean, that groups, Mexican and, and Canadian and American bankers claiming uh, that mining is sustainable. And this is the discourse the Ministry of Economy uh, it's using to to deny, um, to vote against uh, a law that pro proposes the prohibition of mining in protected areas. So, I mean, very quickly, um, and uh, this is based, this is a collective work for the images I am presenting uh, here. Uh, so for, for the SDG one, no poverty between 2000, um, in 12 out of the 15 municipalities, which are the top producers of gold and silver, the levels of poverty are higher than that of the national poverty level, which is already 65%. In eight of, the, in eight of these municipalities, extreme poverty is higher than the average value for Mexico, extreme poverty, which is 28%. So in, in the top eight, uh, mining uh, gold and silver municipalities, extreme poverty, it's larger than 28%. And during the pandemics, we have, we have data that poverty and extreme poverty uh, have increased while the earnings of Grupo Mexico, based on the reports they presented to the Ministry of Economy, increased in 2020 by 20%. So, uh, in relation to hunger, mining competes with family agriculture uh, over lands and water, and it has created crises in several previously pro uh, prosperous agricultural regions, such as the basin of the Colo uh, Sonora River and the Central Valley of Oaxaca, uh, which counts now uh, as regions of extreme poverty. In terms of health and, and, and well-being, I mean, this is my current research, the, the results are really are uh, terrible, the top, the three top mining states have a ha the highest prevalence of kidney illness in the country. Zacatecas, which is the second uh, most important mining state has the highest presence of child, 
childhood developmental disorders in Mexico. Uh, silicosis is very frequent in mining regions, and this has increased risks uh, of dying or, or serious uh, illness uh, uh, due to the COVID-19. In Southern uh, California, the levels of arsenic in urine of children living in communities close to the mines is 32 times higher than the value proposed by the World Health Organization, and it's associated with cancer. In terms of water, uh, mining in Mexico is based on underground water that supplies 40% of the water demand in the country and 20% of the aquifers that for my, my mines operate are exhausted. Water consumption by mines is equivalent to the consumption of 10% of Mexicans, 12 million people. And all the minor mining concessions are legally classified as confidential. Uh, and uh, in terms of inequality, the, the environmental destruction of, of mining has been estimated in 40% of the world prices, but the, the world it's concentrated and the environmental and health uh, and social and economic uh, costs are shared uh, by the public and by vulnerable communities. Um, the top uh, three richest men in the country, one of them is one of the richest men in the world, are miners. <coughs> Uh, most of their wealth uh, comes from the process of privatization of mines in the 90s. Um, and as I said, taxes are very low and there's also inequality in the legal treatment that the mining law provides uh, miners and give to local communities. In terms of life on earth, mining concessions, there are mining concessions in 73 protected areas in six Ramsar sites affecting six, 60,000 hectares. Uh, there's even two concessions and open pit activity in the core of two biosphere reserves. There are concessions in the core of 11 biosphere reserves, including the Monarch Butterfly Reserve. There are 14 marine concessions and 80% 80 80 of the mining concessions are in area with nat natural forest cover. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about, about violence and the lack of institutions that mining is, uh, has created in a country that it's already very, very violent as Colombia. Uh, uh, but Mexico, in terms of Latin America, has been considered by CEPAL, the country with the highest number of mining conflicts. Um, in 2018, there were 460 cases of violence against environmental defenders in mining regions. In 2017, there were 19, uh, 19 community defenders were assassinated, another 15 were murdered in 2019. And 36, almost 40% of these aggressions are perpetrated by the by government actors. So diverse articles of the mining law are inconstitutional, uh, as I said, and mining law uh, violates not, not only diverse articles from the national constitutions, but also violates, violates diverse articles of the ILO, uh, Convention 19, and of the Declaration of the United People of the United Nations on the Rights of Indigenous People endorsed by Mexico. So my final words, I mean, very, very, very quickly, this is a work in progress. It's that development cannot be achieved through extractivism that has exacerbated environmental and even economic destruction and social destruction. And there's an urgent need for new paradigms and narratives of development, environmental and public health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be curious to hear uh, the conversation between uh, uh, differences in mining and, and forestry uh, later. So if you want to unshare your slides, and we can move to our okay. final uh, uh, panelist, which is okay. Tatiana Shore. So Tatiana, okay. if you want to go ahead and, or do you have yeah. slides? Um, I have one slide, which I will ask Gustavo he, if he can project it for me, if he can show it for me, that would be great. But I'll start because I know we have, we don't have enough time. Absolutely. Um, just, 
a quick thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Gustavo and Vicky for organizing the seminar. Very, very interesting. And I must say, I've been, this is I think the fourth, the third or the fourth session. I've been following all the sessions and Every time people talk about policies and policies and policies, I'm always like almost freaking out because I'm exactly on the opposite position as Professor Hajo. So if I was going to play with my title, he said, give me a lab and I'll try to save the Amazon. I could say, give me a policy position and I will try to save the Amazon. So basically what's happening in my life now, I'm an academic, so I'm been trained as an academic, I've worked as an academic, I've been to Columbia University as an academic, but I have this uh, experience in uh, policy making. It's the third time I'm in the government. Whoops, this is not mine. Um, um, I've been, I've been in the... Uh, okay. I've been in I've been in the government. This is my third time in the state government of Amazonas. So now I am the secretary, executive secretary of state for science and technology on Amazonas State. So I'm talking to you from Amazonas and in the interior of the Amazonas, and I'm 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 doing this science policy interface in action. So. What, what, how can a scientist with a very, a human scientist, so I'm an economist with masters in geography and environmental sciences, how can, how does a, a, a scientist um, do policy? How do we do policy? How do we in fact put our hands on it and try to move policy? It's, it's not easy, I must say. It's, and these times aren't even easy, are even more difficult because Pandemia, pandemics, etc. But in 2019, when I was invited into this position, I was very, very reluctant. You all know what happened to Brazil and what was happening to the federal government. And I tried not to, to, to get into this chair, but at the same time, no one wanted. So I said, well, I better sit here and try and hold the things, hold the situation. Uh, or the other option was just to sit back and complain about life. Maybe that would have been easier, but that wasn't an option. So I decided that I was going to try and build uh, or at least hold on some policies that have been, had been built in Brazil and, and try to bring things together. And, and, I, and as a, a human scientist, I said, well, I have to build a narrative. And so I had this first challenge. How can strategic narratives build inclusive policies? As a narrative, as a scientist in a policymaking position, I have, I said, well, I'm going to build in my head this public policy experiment in action, this interface between science and policy in action, a very Laturian way of thinking. But it was, well, let's see how we can build at least a narrative where I can bring the different bubbles into interaction. So I had a, a, a period in, in Brazil where you had this very strong ultra right, all the military, the generals, and you had the left, and you had the, 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 the uh, so society. So how, how can you build a narrative where even in these very awkward uh, situation, you could put people to talk and maybe you could get into the right um, trail. So I said, well, as, any, as every good narrative, I have to have very strong premises and principles. So we built a narrative, which we called Biopolis Amazonas. It's called Biopolis because I started studying to see what's happening around the world. And it was very interesting, the example of Singapore, Biopolis Singapore, and it was interesting because, especially if we look at the role of the state in Singapore, um, the state had a very specific role in, in transforming the Biopolis Singapore into an important medical instrumental hub. And I was very much argumenting that the state has a role and the state has a very important role in the Amazon. But it can't be that old way we look at the state. We do have to think about the state in a future trend. What, what can the state be like? 
And so we built this Biopolis Amazonas as a narrative with two premises. The first one, bringing the UN and the UNPD, um, uh, the objectives of the sustainable development objectives into the discussion. This is a very nice phrase, like leave no one behind. So that was the first premise is that everything we started argumenting, we would always start, we should, any type of construction or action or public policy that we will build in, in the government, we should have as the first premise, leave no one behind. And in the Amazon, when you think about no one, it's a lot of people because before the pandemic, 50% of the population was below poverty line. Now, Probably and, and, and when when I say fifty percent is below poverty line, I don't mean the other fifty percent are very well off. They're not, and so we have a lot of poverty. And poverty is very complex in the Amazon because if you think we still have Amazon state, we have at least twenty two uh, relatively isolated uh, ethnical groups. We have different ethnical. Uh, groups with different types of vulnerability, with different times of contact with modern society, with different interactions with the forest. So leave no one behind. You have to think about how our concepts of poverty uh, will affect policies when we're trying to look at the different vulnerabilities in society. Um, and it was very interesting to start thinking about how do we build a sustainable development with inclusive policies, thinking about the differences. And of course, we also had as a premise that the socio bio geo diversity is very important. When I say geo, I'm not saying simply the geological diversity, but I'm saying the geographical diversity of the Amazon. People think of the Amazon as a unity, it's not a unity. And the, the best example for those not Amazonians to understand is like the acai berry. The acai berry has, we have two species to start. With. We have the one from Pará and we have the one from Amazonas. The one from Pará grows in a, in a bundle. They, they grow many together. The one in Amazonas is just one tree. They're different in everything. So the, um, the para acai is better for food because it's more, it's more fatty. The, the Amazonas one is better for pharmaceutical. In Amazonas state, every 150 kilometers, we have a different lineage of acai. So why, why do I put everything in the same bag and sell it as the same thing? We shouldn't do that. We, we don't have to do that. We have to understand that the geodiversity is very important. And acai is an example, but you can look at all the plants and the people. And there is a very, very uh, drastic um, differences between them. And when and bringing that together with not leaving anyone behind, we also have the question related to the different temporality, the historical temporalities of the population. So sometimes we have uh, uh, an, an ethnic group, which is very important in the Brazil nut value chain, but they're still very, have, they, they have recent contact. So they're not very good in maths, in our maths. They have another logic of maths. So a simple question as how much do you produce is not a simple question. So we, we, everything you do, you have to think about who you're talking to and how you're gonna talk to that person and how that policy is gonna arrive there. So we have premises and we have principles. What is the principle? First is conservation of the biodiversity. That has to be a principle in any type of development plan, sustainable development plan that we do. Also, we have a principle of diminishing the social territorial inequalities. Amazonas and the northern region of Brazil is the poorest region for centuries. We have not managed to work on uh, getting a better life for people. I always use as an example uh, a data which for me is absolutely shocking, is the number of girls from 10 to 14 years old that give birth. It's not that they get pregnant, they give birth. And we haven't changed that since the 90s. We're 30, Brazil has changed this, this, this number. The, the northern region has changed this number. Amazonas, no. So something's wrong, you know? And so we have to think about that. 
The third principle is the role of science and technology and the knowledge of nature in building a green social economic development. You know, science has many, many folds into this uh, premise. One is the one I'm talking to you about. How can us scientists try and build inclusive policies, be in politics as a, as a political action and try to make things uh, more uh, logical. And, and uh, the fourth principle, which is, which I, I, I like it a lot, is like to adopt the principle of the agro cattle industry and say that we want to expand the native biodiverse forests. We don't only want to protect the forests that are standing because we might find ourselves in the near future just protecting an island the way things are going. So we have to have a more aggressive policy of expansion of forests. Well, so we built this narrative with a very, very, very strong uh, premises and principles. We went into details and we would talk inside the government of all of these principles and how important it was and how important it is to understand that we have a competitive we have a comparative advantage, which is the Amazonian biome. Amazonas state is one of the best preserved biome. And we also have a uh, competitive advantage, which is the industrial pole of Manaus. Manaus has industries for the last 53 years. So we have to look at that. So what we did inside the government, the first thing we did was call into our partnership, the UNPD, and insert in all the states planning for the next four years, so the, from 2020 to 2023, every action in Amazonas state government planning is related to a sustainable development goal. Um, it wasn't easy, as you can imagine, for me to convince the Secretary of Finance that his policies and his actions had to be related to uh, a sustainable development goal meant I had to go back and explain to him what was UNPD, what were the, the, the sustainable development goals and why he should do that. The good thing is that our governor, he was very, he was very happy about um, this conversation. He let me do the work. So he gave me, as we say in Portuguese, carta branca. He believed in it. So we managed to put all the government into this um, alignment. And later it was very interesting because the governor said to me, he said, Tatiana, you know that thing, those, those SDGs, you said we had to put them into actions. I said, yes. And, and I said to him, they're not mine, just to, to, to be clear. Well, because of them and because the Secretary of Finance has them in their plan, we were able to begin our discussions with the World Bank because when they saw that all our planning of the government had was related to the UNPD, the agenda, the 2030 agenda, we could do, we could do, we could start negotiating um, a plan for the outs. So that was good. And, and also we organized two structural programs bioeconomy Amazonas and a, a program for science and technology. What are these programs about? They, these programs are basically, how do we link the biome to the industrial pole? And basically we've been discussing a lot of bioeconomy. We've been discussing a lot of the importance of biotech, the technology of information and communication, and also, which is important, create, creative economy. Um, if you think that the Manaus opera a show and the opera festival in Manaus uh, have, makes more jobs than seven, uh, seven groups of industries, um, seven industrial groups in, in the industrial pole, you start looking at creative economy as a very important um, job, uh, job policy, right? And we also understand that we have to move around in an industrial policy, but an industrial policy isn't sufficient. So we have to think about an urban policy and we have to think about regional policy. All of these we structured uh, having this narrative well-established inside the government. 
With that, we started reconceptualizing the role of conservation units and how to protect traditional and indigenous populations. And we have an action. I'll just talk about two specific, very quickly, two specific actions we have. One is what we call the, P, the Parque Científico e Tecnológico Saberes da Floresta, which is a scientific park at a very interesting region at the frontier of Brazil, Peru, Colombia. It's more than a thousand miles from, from Manaus, but there we have three universities. We have 50 PhDs. We have 180 and 128 masters as professors of this university. And I managed to convince the federal government, the Ministry of De Regional Development that we should invest in a very different technological and scientific park. So that's an interesting um, example. And the second one is the Innova Socio Bio, which is a, is a partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture. So as a science and technology uh, gap cabinet, we managed to include the Ministry of Agriculture. And this is a very interesting project in terms of science because we want to diminish the asymmetries of information throughout the value chains of Brazil nut, Pirarucu, and Guarana as a, a, a pilot project showing that how it is important to have evidence-based policy, but to have evidence-based policy, I have to have information and to have information, I have to diminish uh, the asymmetry of information throughout the value chain. And this has been a very interesting experience of how to put um, different groups to talk about all of this. So I will conclude and hope that we can have time for some conversations and thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so we do have some time for conversations. We have about 20 minutes remaining in the session. Uh, I'm going to make just a, a, a couple of wrapping up comments uh, to include, but if while I'm doing that, people want to raise their hand uh, to participate in the Q&A at the end, um, we can collect some questions and then come back to the authors for uh, some responses. But I was just struck across all of the presentations, uh, you know, about the importance of having somebody that's willing to listen <laughs> to uh, what you want to tell them as an academic whether that be the person in government or somebody on the ground who is, you know, maybe taking some more informal collective action uh, to try to preserve uh, forests or in my world, uh, fisheries or, or, or uh, the health around a mine. And so one thing that I was just curious about, uh, and we, we can come back to it at the end after we have conversation with, uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people uh, in the audience have to say, uh, but if we do have time, I'd be interested to hear, you know, how you solve this kind of chicken and egg problem where you kind of need somebody to already be willing to listen or want to listen if you want to have kind of an easier time getting your uh, work as an academic uh, to, to have a big impact uh, on governance, at least in my experience. And so I'd be curious to hear uh, what people have to say about that. But right now, if people have questions uh, from the audience, we can take those and then we can have some responses from the uh, uh, authors, and then we'll go forward. So I see one hand. Uh, if you want to use your hand raise function, or if you want to chat in the public chat, or, or to me, then we can uh, do that. So Isabella, I see your hand up, uh, and then we'll take some additional questions. Thank you. Um, these were great presentations. I, I have two questions. Uh, one for Maria Alejandra. It's kind of a series of questions, but I'll try to summarize it. If you can talk a little bit more about that, that one community um, that that was not overcome by uh, coca, um, the, the illegal coca trade. And in particular, um, if, what, what has your different uh, research, what does it say about um, Afro Latin Americans or Afro Colombians as as a subject of environmental politics, you know, and, and environmental justice. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of some really interesting research, new research that that finds that Afro Colombians are much more vulnerable 
to land grabs or especially during the you know the recent violent uh, period of um, of the country. So just in general, if you can give us a little bit more on that. And then for Tatiana, I'm really interested in the strategic narratives and I was wondering, um, you know, who's who's the audience for this? It seems that there are different audiences and um, and clearly it ends up being the international organizations may be a key audience, but especially domestically, um, why, why does the strategic narrative matter? To whom, how does that uh, help you advance your work? Thank you. So just in the interest of time, we're going to collect a few questions and then we can uh, uh, open it up. So I had a uh, question uh, from Eduardo, if you wanted to uh, ask your question. No, um, my points are not questions, are just uh, reactions and comments. So perhaps I can wait for the second round. Go ahead with the questions. Go, go ahead, I think, because it's better if we have everything together and then the, the speakers can return to react to all of it so that we don't lose time. So you can go okay, ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, you are the boss. Now I will change to Spanish. Um, Sobre esta eh, presentación de, de María Alejandra, eh, me parece que sería interesante eh, reflexionar en esa condición de cultivos ilegales, cuál es el papel de lo ilegal. Porque en mis visitas a, al Cauca, estando en el campo, casi todo es ilegal. No solo cultivos ilícitos, como puede ser los que derivan en coca, sino también he visto cultivos muy extensos de, de marihuana y también he visto, por ejemplo, minería ilegal de oro. Entonces, la, la condición de ilegalidad permea las relaciones económicas y sociales y en algunos sitios no son la excepción, son ge la generalidad y no pueden ser separadas de formas de, de violencia constantemente presentes, que repetidamente se sienten. Mi punto en esto es que hay una construcción de la naturaleza desde lo ilegal, y hay una construcción de la naturaleza desde la violencia, y que son mucho más comunes y presentes en América Latina de lo que asumimos porque son a su vez más difíciles de estudiar. Yo, yo creo que la ponencia de México apunta muy correctamente al advertir ese nexo entre minería y, y violencia. Y dando un paso más, en, en la presentación de Rayao sobre the, the big science and the, the data, science policy, también, después de haber trabajado como 10 años para hacer eh, informes para Naciones Unidas sobre el estado del ambiente en América Latina y haber dialogado con los gobiernos, mi impresión, mi, mi experiencia, es que los gobiernos solo reaccionan cuando ven esa información en la prensa internacional. Si al ministro Salles en Brasil lo leen Science on World Development, no le importa. Le importa si sale en el New York Times o reacciona si sale en Le Monde, porque eso ocasiona la repetición de los medios de prensa en el sur. Y, y, y quiero también una nota de advertencia en eso. La acumulación de información científica por sí sola no cambia la forma de vincularnos con la naturaleza y con entender el desarrollo. Porque no los quiero deprimir como el viernes pasado, pero ya van 50 años de acumular información científica de todo tipo, de lo mal que estamos. Y la clase política no entiende, y no entienden. Entonces, los cambios necesitan de esa información científica, pero ella sola no es suficiente necesariamente tiene que acoplarse a, a otros componentes de cambio político. 
Okay, those were my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think Ricardo Gutierrez is the next hand that I saw, uh, but I might be out of order at this point. So please go ahead. Thank you, Jeffrey. Excellent presentations. I had two questions, but Isabel already asked one of them, which was a question of community organization in Buenaventura to Maria Alejandra. So I like to, to hear to her response to that. So my question is, uh, is for, uh, for Leticia. Uh, you compared uh, the poverty level in the municipal, in the, in the Mayan municipalities to the national poverty level. I wonder if you could examine the evolution of poverty within the municipalities. So as to see whether there is a change in the poverty level a long time in those municipalities and whether that is related or not to mining, because it's, that's one of the point, I mean, in discussions about the, the, the positive or not effects of, of mining. And then Gustavo and, and Vicky, I see your hands. Uh, if you have questions, uh, Gustavo, if you have one. Sure. Um, just a, a quick question for uh, from Maria Alejandra. Um, you know, you mentioned that, that you, you you mentioned this kind of like ideological perspective on you know on um, on collective land titling, and you you address the issue of, of sort of the well being of. And, and sort of the environmental questions, but I, I wonder if you looked at all sort of like the economic productivity and sort of the, the um, that kind of question, right? Just just thinking of the economist kind of critique of this thing. Um, and, you know, my sense is that, that oftentimes we assume that these sort of like more traditional systems are less productive, but sometimes that's a matter of not having the right methods to sort of ask what's being produced. And I, I think I think some of the sort of general surveys that we use to look at what people are producing doesn't really capture the full diversity of, of things that are being produced in these kinds of systems. So just wondering if you if you looked into that at all. And and Vicky. Yes, I, I also have a question, I think, for Maria Alejandra and, and maybe related to Leticia and this idea that collective uh, titling, I mean, on that communities resist, I, I'm not sure it's illegality in light of Eduardo's comments, but certainly these external forces that come to invade their land, right? The, the drug organizations or, or the forestation. And so it's clear to me that collective titles kind of generates the community because we are all in this together, and, and I don't have an individual uh, uh, title, I cannot sell. So, uh, and, and even the work of Torres Wong that comes in the next panel for, for Mexico has shown resistance to, to mining being successful at the community level. Um, but do we know, for instance, when the community would be more successful beyond the fact that they have a collective title that bind them together? I mean, is there any other uh, uh, factor that makes them more successful in, in resisting? You mentioned social capital, but it wasn't clear to me how that was measured or how would we recognize it. So we have a couple more questions, uh, some in the chat as well. But I'm going to take a second to uh, let Maria Alejandra respond to some of the uh, various questions that have been asked. You can take your pick. Uh, I also had the same question as the one in the chat about uh, the typology, and this relates, of course, to what Vicky uh, just asked as well about how you measure social capital, but feel free to, to take your pick. Should I start now? Yes, please. Yeah, please. great. Well, thank you for all the questions and reaction. I, maybe I should have spent the 10 minutes of talking about this uh, resistance instead of showing the whole context. Um, I'm just going to share quickly uh, this slide to, to answer some of the questions um, that has been raised. 
First, just reacting to what Jeffrey and Eduardo said about policymakers, uh, because myself with this project has suffered from that. I think that all of us suffer from confirmation bias, but especially policymakers. And despite the evidence showing that collective action, uh, the collective property in Colombia has been effective, there are still no support in the collective property. So confirmation bias in this story is very important. Regarding the question of Isabella, that also may uh, answer a bit or react to Eduardo's comments. Um, maybe just to explain a bit of this typology that we create, uh, we did this based on surveys and interviews with uh, community councils in Buenaventura, as I said. And basically what we found is that there are some leadership resistance and some community resistance, right? And there are some degrees of leadership resistance and some degree of community resistance. But only really when the, the most effective leadership resistance that I call confrontational, it sort of have an active engagement of the community really is when that uh, resistance is effective. It means that there is legitimacy and influence of leadership in the community because there are some leaders who resist to collective action, but it doesn't have sort of a, 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 a resonance in the community. But also it's effective when there is uh, synergies among the different levels of grassroots organizations within the community. Also when there is a, a, an important stock of social capital, but also when there is a specific normative content with, it, with, the, with that social capital is infused. Regarding social capital, and we did this only for three communities and we, which in each we measure, we did surveys of 200 surveys in each community, community councils. We measure social capital based on participation in associations, based on uh, trust in institutions and based on rules to manage the resources. And this community that has been, is surrounded by coca crops, but without coca crops, it has, shows higher capital, social capital in all the variables that we use. This is, you know, this is the, sort of the, there are many, uh, there is many type of resistance and a lot of a spectrum of resistance in, in this region, but Jurumangi and uh, this community council that has been in the news, et cetera, has been one of the example of resistance. Indeed, in these areas, Eduardo said, illegal is part, the illegality is part of the, of the, of the economy and the social relationship, but there are some communities who have taken steps to resist to that explicitly. Not because it's illegal, they also have resisted to legal uh, activities such as palm, African palm plantations that are violent to the community. So it's not because it's illegal that they are resistant, it's because coca doesn't arrive alone or illegal mining doesn't arrive by itself is because everything that is violent, they will resist on. They have this idea of collective leaderships, uh, which they have a sort of a school of leadership that they have been trained a lot of their inhabitants to be leaders. And this is part also to, to deal with the risk of the violence, right? Because then you don't know, and this is very, you know, it's awful to talk about this, but it's like, they don't know who to kill, you know, because there's so many that are leaders that is a collective type of leadership. They have done, for example, a lot of a, a, um, manual eradication. They have done also what they call mingas or collective action to prevent the enter, entrance of illegal miners, outside miners. They are miners themselves and they are from the perspective of the government, they are illegal but what they are really are, are informal. They haven't have titles, but they've been doing mining from the last 300 years. Um, so this is the, 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 the example of this community who has been doing this resistance. This, for example, let me put it bigger so you can see it for those who speak Spanish. They have this board in every single village of that community council. They said, we don't want illicit crops and we are resistant also to, to uh, uh, monocultivos of pa African palm. So it's not only about coca, it's any activity that threatens their, their territory. Uh, quickly regarding the idea of, um, uh, I have looked to the idea of uh, uh, economic activities. We, we have 
more from a qualitative perspective, we have been studying sort of these community enterprises. And I think part of the discussion in these communities is what, is, what, what a, a, a community enterprise or a entrepreneurship implies in a collective territory because they are not, everything is not collective within Afro-Colombian communities. Families have private activities, etc. So I think the next step in this literature is how, how you develop economic enterprises, community enterprises within collective territories. Uh, these are not indigenous communities in the sense of very traditional, uh, uh, not connected with the market. Afro-Colombian communities are totally connected with the market. So there is a question of how they develop these um, economic uh, enterprises. Regarding just the ideological perspective, my comment about the ideological, well, everything is ideological, but my, my comment about the ideological perspective was regarding the economists, no? who, who didn't ask me or any of my co-authors who have published the paper, only interview uh, uh, politicians in the most important city of the Pacific, which is Cali, that are against collective titling, because I think that collective titling is, is preventing the development or main development to enter the territory. No? So it's a very contested issue uh, uh, in, in, in Colombia. I don't know if I answer everything, but I try. Ah, the, the other thing is the violence against uh, Afro-Colombian communities that Isabella uh, mentioned. Indeed, but collective titling has prevented that people that did land grabbing are able to retitle those lands something that didn't happen in peasant communities in Colombia. So still collective titling has protected them, them a lot, but I don't want to take more time, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, no problem. Uh, yeah, I, I, I let you go first on the questions because uh, you were uh, you, you hewed very closely to your time allotment during the presentation, so I appreciate that. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Laura, or sorry, Lauren, uh, if you want to ask that, and then we'll give everybody a uh, couple, the panelists a couple of minutes for, for closing thoughts, uh, if you don't mind. So Lauren, go ahead, and then we'll have closing thoughts from the three other panelists. Yeah, I don't know if it's fair since it's also for Maria Alejandra. <laughs> so I, I just, I, um, I also did my field work. I'm, I'm a PhD candidate at um, UC Berkeley, and I also have done my field work um, on deforestation dynamics in and worked in the um, in the Pacific of Colombia, also with Yoramangi and um, and some of the communities right right around there. Um, and my question is kind of you. You mentioned the the dynamics of the the difficulty of not having a state kind of behind um, the the community um, management of their territories. And I have been asking this question to myself in all of my research of like what what would be the ideal role of the state? Obviously, the state comes in as the as the uh, army often in these territories and um, you know that the communities are asked to resist have to resist that them as well um, but I've also found in some of my research that even when the state comes in um, as you know sort of development aid um, it is uh, undermining the collective action and the and the sort of leadership um, in these territories. And so I wonder if you found in your research kind of what the ideal role of the state is in sort of supporting governance um, and supporting community control. I know your Mangi has, you know, sort of managed that relationship pretty um, strongly. That's also difficult for communities to do. Um, so I'd love to hear more on your take on, uh, on that. And especially, I mean, given yeah. that we've been hearing about these other, um, you know, role of the role of the state and vis-a-vis -vis communities in this context. Thank, thank you very much. So I want to give the other panelists a, a chance to give their their closing thoughts uh, briefly. We might go a couple of minutes over time if people are uh, okay with that. Uh, and then, you know, of course, you can follow up uh, offline with folks. So, Hani, if you want to give us your uh, a couple closing thoughts, and then we'll go back down the order. Maria, uh, uh, we can come back to you if you have time, but Hani. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, I'm, I'm answering a couple of, of points uh, uh, raised, you know, uh, uh, to me by you know by Eduardo, Gudinas, and also um, Copperman. 
And um, well, in terms of, uh, yeah, um, I agree with you, Eduardo. Uh, Sales was not reacting to, to a publication. And I mean, we don't believe science should, should be heard by itself. He was reacting to the reaction of the publication, right? And, uh, and that's why it's also important, um, uh, you know, to, to know what kind of publics and where you publish. And, and also, which was actually part of our thinking process as we developed the text of our article and also as we developed the communication strategy behind the article uh, to reach the right uh, uh, public media venues. And, and even though, you know, it's a, a 73 pages a publication with a lot of data sets, you know, hundreds and hundreds of figures, but it, I can tell you in one phrase what it is, you know, what's the main finding. And usually you need to have that, you know, uh, nutshell kind of language in order to appeal to journalists and then to find your three seconds on national television and then to have those sorts of, and for us scientists, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite difficult to do that at times. And, and, but we have been doing that for, for some, uh, uh, for some time. And, and uh, now things have become, have become more complicated because before um, the channels for judging whether the government is good or bad were pretty much those established media outlets. Uh, now, you know, Bolsonaro sends WhatsApp directly to its voters with oh, lots of fake news, not only him, but see Trump and see others. And this actually makes things more, uh, more difficult and more scattered. Uh, but I think we should not, you know, simply give up because now you have to fight against those, you know, waves and waves of fake news. And then and, and my aunt tells me fake news about my own work. And, and uh, because she receives from those, you know, very crazy uh, um, uh, networks, but if we have to, to keep up. Um, and there, there is a question about municipalities. We haven't gone to that level uh, formally, but we have been exploring some of that data and the amount of situations where the mayor himself, uh, the local legislator, are actually directly involved in land grabbing deforestation. It's it's huge, and actually that's one of the things we would like to move on uh, in the near future to see the, the connections quantitatively. So how much of the big, how many of the big deforests in the Amazon are registered in political parties, for instance, or are have of, of, of positions in office? That might be. I think it's a it's a very interesting future uh, analysis, and and the means are there to, to be done. Uh, so that's it. You know, great conversation here. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic, uh, Leticia. If you want to unmute yourself. Sorry. Well, gracias al doctor Gudiñas por los, los comentarios sobre, sobre la ilegalidad y la violencia en los territorios de América Latina. Well, I'm getting back to, to English. The question on poverty, I mean, this is a, a research in progress uh, and municipalities may not be uh, the best unit of research because they are tend to be larger. But what we find is that in urban, in urban localities, uh, in some of the urban localities, the access to public services has increased. But in the small localities that used to be agricultural in mining regions, uh, income has lowered. So uh, in average, uh, poverty is very high and tends to be stagnant in most of the mining regions. Uh, so, but what we find, I mean, this, this in a, from 1990 to 2020, but what we find is that inequality in a regional basis, in a municipality level has increased uh, from uh, over the, the, the last 30 years. So using not, not the Gini index, but the Palma index. Uh, and I would like to, to reflect on collective action and uh, which communities are more able to resist I, I think there are two, two issues. I mean, what we find is that indigenous and forest communities in Mexico are those which are resisting, resisting better. But this is associated, yes, with a traditional value of the land, but also with an economic value of the land, when, where there are uh, community forestry, which take place in 30% or used to take place before the pandemic in 30% of Mexican forest communities. Communities are more engaged in defending their, their territory as it's also a mean of, of livelihoods and local public goods and so on. And in these cases, I think community themselves are not able to resist what we, you see, it's, it's a, a relational form of social capital. I mean, they, those who are now uh, most able to resist in not only in a social movements, but also defending themselves in the courts, 
and uh, searching for legal transformation is that they have alliances with other actors, other communities for sure, but legislators, human rights uh, organizations who have a very key role and, uh, and academics. So I think the, the key is that it becomes, as it was the case in Salvador uh, years ago, uh, like a national perception of the danger and the unfairness of mining in, in the land. Thank you. Well, and thank, thank you, you for the conversation, very important. Yeah, I wish we could talk for another hour. Uh, but Tatiana, if you yeah. have uh, closing thoughts, you received one other uh, comment in the chat, but feel free to yeah. uh, well. address it. Sort of okay, great. Thank you very much. Good, good to hear all these examples from Mexico and Colombia. Well, uh, Jeffrey and Isabella, it's 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 not easy. It's not easy to to be heard, and and you have to build strategies to bring your interlocutor into the narrative. So what I, I, I did in, through many months in 2019, I built this paper point presentation. It wasn't even a presentation on, on the PowerPoint. It was a paper point presentation that I would open it in the person's table. And because if we start putting presentation on policymakers and policy, don't pay attention. They don't, they don't have any patience to listen more than five minutes of what you have to say. So you really have to, or attract their attention to something which is really weird. So my paper point presentation was very weird and I would stand up and stand beside the person I was trying to bring into the debate and start opening the paper and, and dialoguing directly with him or with her. And, and it's incredible how it works in all different areas. So I, I, at the same time, inside the state, so it's it's not, it's when we talk about the state, it's also not something that, that as in the US, Brazil also has a deep state, you know, some very good public servants that are working hard not to let things just fall apart. Uh, so inside the state and also with like for the industrial guys or in, and for the, the communities and the collectives, you have to adjust your language, you have to bring them into what is calling, and you have to call the attention that, especially in this moment in Brazil, we need the dialogue, we need to talk, we need to sit down and talk. A lot of what we did, which was very interesting and talks a little bit with what uh, Hajan has been saying, everything I do in the state, I work on what we call the five L's principle. So I call many sectors inside the state, federal, state, and municipalities. I call um, the organizations of the base, extractivisms, associations, cooperatives, indigenous organizations. I call also the different sectors, the different private sectors, because you have local private sectors, you have regional and you have national, you have international. So it's interesting to bring different private sectors into the debate. Then I call also the financial institutions because anything we do, we need money. So how are they seeing the world and let them hear from the world how they should finance and academia. And academics are extremely important in these, these moments, Hajan, even though it's a difficult thing because you have to, sometimes you have to close your eyes to things you don't want, or you simply have to say, in this, I will not participate. So I'm very clear in the government for where my limits are. So I said this, okay, the government's gonna do, I'm not gonna participate. <laughs> and if you want to send me back to the university, I always say this, if you want to send me back to the university, send me back and I'll go back to the university. But, and why is academia important? Because academia um, says what no one else has the courage to say. And, and that is very important, especially when you're in the table negotiating um, public policies or negotiating narratives. When you have a good academic uh, empirically base that can say what has to be said, it's, it's fantastic. I'll give you one example, which is native bees. There was this big thing in Amazonas government to attract uh, uh, a private sector, which was wanting to bring, to do honey from African and European bees. The problem is that African and European bees do not pollinate 
um, native trees. They don't work in the forest, they get lost. So, you know, and, and, and they only work for deforested areas. And we have all these native bees. But there was this big discussion in the government about, well, the native bees, you know, they don't have scale. You know, everything is like, they don't have scale, they don't have scale. And we want to bring this big industry, it's the second biggest industry in, in honey in the world. So we got this academic person, which is a specialist in native bees. And it was fantastic. She sat in this round table and she said, look, I don't know what you guys are doing. You, know, you don't know about the forest. You don't know that you're, what you're doing. And then with that, we totally transformed the policy. So we started working on native bees and the question of this more African and, and European bees were left, was left a little bit behind. So it's not easy. It's not comfortable, um, but in sometimes in life we do have to try and and make policies. Not only say how good it was is to be um, talking about how important policies are. Right. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, closing comments. And we are over time, so unfortunately we'll have to close the the session at this point. Uh, but it seems like it could go on for for much longer. Uh, so thanks everyone for participating. Thanks for the questions and the very uh, good back and forth at the end. The next panel will be in two weeks on May 7th. So yes. thanks everyone for sticking around. Remember, time. the next panel is in two weeks, politics and policy. So we will continue with some of the same topics of the conversation. Thanks to everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.